ago, I was I was preaching, um, and some of you probably heard this story before. Uh, I was preaching, and it had been I had a lot of stress in my life, and I was uh, I have a tendency to get overwhelmed if I allow myself. Uh, so I've got to really schedule things out sometimes because I can I can get overwhelmed easily. And uh, I mean, it was also in the early days of of my ministry, and um, so I was. I had a very stressful week, and I wasn't. I had, I had all my notes there, but I wasn't. I didn't put as much prep time as usual into my message uh, because of other things that I had going on, and so I was in the middle of the message, and everything like my worst fear happened. Everything just went blank. And I had my notes in front of me, and I tried to gather myself and, and look back at my notes. And for some reason, it was like God said no. And, like, seriously, I mean, I didn't literally see this, but it was like all the words on the page just scattered. Uh, I don't know if you'd call that. A, I, I don't think outside of that I've never had an anxiety attack, but that's, that's, that's what happened. And so it forced me to stop and basically just confess that I've been really stressed and I didn't have it all together that morning. Uh, and it really turned into a beautiful thing. Uh, we, we, we turned into small group time and people uh, were uh, confessing and, and, and talking and sharing stories and there were tears that were flowing and it was a beautiful time. Not for me though. Um, I got home and I told my wife I just wanted to crawl up like a fetus and suck my thumb. Uh, it was a very vulnerable uh, time for me. Paul, the Apostle Paul, in in First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter two three, he makes a confession, an interesting confession. He tells the church that when he had first met them, when he first came and he shared the gospel with them, that. Uh, that he had came in, in weakness, and he was actually afraid. He had come in, in fear and in, uh, in trembling and in, in weakness. It was a very vulnerable statement that, uh, that Paul made, but, uh, but Paul was being real. He was being real. And, uh, you know, Paul knew that he had lots of enemies everywhere he went because there was enemies of the gospel. There was people that didn't like his message, and, uh, but also the Greeks... They made a big deal about how eloquent of a speaker uh, you were. I mean, they, they really valued that. They really uh, valued uh, good orators. And that wasn't Paul. He wasn't the best, uh, he wasn't the best speaker. And, uh, but he could have put on a mask. He could, have, he could have faked it. He could have tried to show up as his, his best self and, and uh, tried to be articulate, but he intentionally didn't with the, uh, the Corinthians. And it was because they valued, it's not that we can't practice our speaking and become better speakers, but because they so highly valued it, he didn't want them to miss the power of Christ. He didn't want to make it all about him. He wanted it to be about Jesus, so he refused to act like he had it all together. He preferred to show up in weakness and fear and trembling as himself and let God work through him. Paul told the Philippians, he says, uh, not that I have already reached the goal or I am already perfect, like spiritually, not that I'm already without sin, he says, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. So in essence, what he's saying, because I know who I am in, in Jesus Christ, I can, I can be myself, and I can admit that I'm weak and that I still have sin, but I'm also free to pursue Jesus, right? And the righteousness that he has already declared is, is mine. That's a real beautiful statement in Philippians 3.12. So if I were to ask people in this room or people who know you best, if I, were, if I was to ask them to describe you, would they wor use words like authentic? or sincere? Would other people call you authentic or sincere? Is that a way that they might describe you? What is authenticity? It's the, it's the ability to be honest, 
to be real, right? To be sincere, to, to live our lives without hypocrisy, uh, without a mask, lives where we aren't pretending. Because when we constantly act like we, especially Christians in the church, when we act like we've got it all together, you know what it does? It robs God of his glory, right? Because it becomes all about us, right? When we're putting on the mask and we're acting like we have it all together, it robs Jesus of his glory. And it also robs other people of the opportunity to be inspired by God's ongoing transformation work in us. So I wanted to take a look uh, here in Matthew chapter 23, because we have a good, a pretty good, one of the best examples, I think, in in the scriptures of inauthenticity, and that's that of the Pharisees. I'm going to have a vulnerable moment of authenticity as I admit that I'm getting older, and uh, I've got my first pair of reading glasses here. I've been straining when I try and read my Bible, uh, so it was time. Thank you. (laughs) So Jesus had some very strong words for the Pharisees. Uh, he's speaking to, to the crowds. He, he often had big crowds around at times, and then other times it was just a few of them. And he's here with the crowds and his disciples. And he says in, uh, in verse 2 there in 23, he says, The scribes and the Pharisees, that's the religious officials of, of the day. Um, that's the pastors, elders, and, and deacons, if you will. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat, he says to his disciples. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but don't do the works that they do. So here we are in the transition from the old covenant to the the new covenant. So the Jews are still uh, under the law, uh, the law of Moses. So he's he's telling them, be good Jews and, and do what they say, but don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. It says in verse 4, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, uh, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Um, they're legalistic. They, they, they had all these man-made rules. They had all these rules. They added on to God's rules. You know, like you would have keep the Sabbath. Well, they would start to define the Sabbath. Well, what does that look like? What does work look like? And, and so they had these big books with all these rules, and uh, they laid those burdens on other people, but they failed to do things, namely uh, the great commandment, love God and love people. They, they, they failed to do the important things. Verse 5, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. Their righteousness was in order to be seen by others. For they, they make their phylactery, phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Uh, they wore their best church clothes. You know, they were those who... who uh, always had their Bible under their arm, you know, wherever they went so that people could see it. Um, And they loved the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greeting places and marketplaces. And they loved to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. And you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither call them instructors, for you have one instructor the Christ, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I, I don't believe that Jesus is literally telling us that we can't ever call somebody a teacher or an instructor or a pastor. Jesus, a lot of times, he used what's called hyperbole. And he used those exaggerated statements because he was very serious about what he, he meant. It was a figure of speech. It was a way of saying uh, something. And so I would say I would not hesitate. You can make your own choice, but I'm not going to stop uh, honoring people by calling them doctor or instructor or pastor or what have you. Uh, but people, however, I, I, I knew a person once that was going to get their doctorate, and, and uh, I don't know if, if, if this person was joking or or not, but he said that he, he the reason he the main reason he wanted his doctor is so people had to call him him uh, him doctor. And so I, I have a feeling it was it was a bit of of, uh, of joking going on there. But if somebody demands it, if it's about their ego, like it was with the Pharisees, I believe that's what Jesus is telling you. They don't deserve it. You know, they don't they don't deserve that kind of uh, honor. And and uh, so um, 
with myself. I don't, if you want to call me pastor, you can. If you just want to call me Scott, that's, that's fine too. Let's look at verse 13. Let's move on. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor you allow those who would enter to go in. So they had no mercy. They, they, they showed uh, nobody, uh, they, they didn't show others uh, grace. And Jesus said, uh, by doing this, by refusing to let people in the kingdom, by thumbing their nose at people, they were the ones that stood outside. Remember, they stood outside the party when Jesus was in there with the tax collectors and the sinners. And they said, why do you eat with these sinners? Why are you always hanging out with these people? And he said, he said I didn't come uh, for those who were well. I came for those who are, are sick. And so the Pharisees thought they were better than others, and in doing that, those who needed grace the most, they shut the kingdom of heaven in their faces. Jesus said, by doing this, you reveal that you're not a part of the kingdom yourself. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you travel across land and sea to make a single proselyte, that's a convert, and when he becomes a convert, You make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Now, there's ministries uh, out there that that, uh, claim to be Christian ministries, but they're very uh, uh, condescending, you know, and they they produce replicas. People sit under their teachings, and they become just like that, and then they're sent out into the world, and that's what he's saying to the Pharisees. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the, the temple that is made that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it, and whoever swears by the temple swears by it and him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits uh, upon it. So they, 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 whatever suited their agenda, they would kind of move things around. You ever played a, a game with somebody maybe when you were a kid and somebody kept changing the rules? Maybe it was your first time playing, and they kept, it seemed like they kept cheating, you know, kept moving things around. That's what the Pharisees did. They would move the rules according to whatever suited them. So if something was owed, uh, owed them in the temple, like a, a gold or, or uh, a gift, they would, they would fashion it in such a way where people had to give that. But they swore by the temple all the time, which was greater than the gift or the gold. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 23. Hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected, listen, look at this, verse 23, the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So again, they... This would be like, you know, people show up to, to, to church, good church tenders, good, good tithers, you know, they do all the good, good, uh, good church things, the Bible studies, they do all those things, but they don't, they don't actually live the Christian life. They don't live out the life that God has actually called uh, them to, you know. God has called us, the whole point of this Christian life is, is Jesus has come to make us whole so that we would be lovers of God and lovers of people and we would go out and distribute that in the world so that we would be different. He's not worried about just our our church attendance and our Bible reading. He wants us to be transformed and go out in the world and love radically. And so they neglected justice and mercy and faithfulness. Some still do that today. They're full of church, but not full of Jesus. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate but inside you're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and plate that the outside may 
be clean. Jesus is always more concerned about what's on the inside than what's on the outside. The word hypocrite, it means actor. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Inside you are dead. You look good on the outside, but inside you are dead. You remember the, uh, there was a Pharisee, there's a story that Jesus told of a Pharisee and a tax collector, which the tax collectors, the Jewish people did not like. They looked, saw them as traitors and, and corrupt, and they're outside of the temple, and they're and they're, they're praying before God. And remember the, the Pharisee's prayer, the good church goer's <laughs> prayer. His prayer was like, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I thank you that actually that I'm not like this guy right over here. And do you remember the tax collector's prayer? God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said, do you know who went away justified? It was the tax collector and not the Pharisee. Why? Because he was authentic. He was real. And so the rest of the chapter, Jesus goes on to say, you guys think that you're on the side of the prophets and you honor the prophets of old, but you are actually just like the persecutors of the prophets. You're like the ones that killed the prophets. Indeed, God is going to send more prophets in the future and you will do the same. And they did. Read the book of Acts. Well, they killed Jesus. They crucified Jesus. And then throughout the book of Acts, They go around persecuting Jesus' people. The Pharisees were self-righteous. They were hypocrites. They pretended to be perfect. Uh, No one was inspired by their transformation or growth because there wasn't any. They just saw criticism and condemnation. So how do we learn? How did we end up learning to be this way? How did we learn to put on the mask to be inauthentic? Well, most of us don't like to be criticized. I don't think anyone likes to be judged. Uh, We don't like to be rejected by others. And so when we don't feel safe around our peers or we don't feel uh, safe around maybe other authority figures, we learned a certain way of being. And when we have a skewed view of God, we learn a certain way of being. We learn to hide it and to, to fake it. That's what we learn to do. A friend of mine, as a boy, uh, and teenager, he attended a very uh, legalistic, uh, legalistic church, and he said it was very damaging. He said, but one thing he learned about that, that church was that church had more sin in it than any other church he's ever been a part of. <laughs> they had all the rules and regulations, and they were making sure everybody was following tightly, but you know what they were doing? They were all faking it. They were all hiding it, right? Legalist, legalism has that tendency. And the results are damaging. That brokenness, it ends up getting passed on to us. And so what happens is we repeat the pattern. We become more judgmental. We become critical. And we become inauthentic. Inauthenticity stifles the work of God in our lives. As long as we're faking it, God has nothing to work with. As long as we don't let our walls down, God can't use that. He won't use that. He chooses not to use that. And the other thing is, is other people cannot see God's transformation. We're just like the Pharisees. They can't see God's transformation in us. All they see is condemnation and judgmental attitudes. This is something that we must unlearn. Inauthenticity causes us, and I meant to put the scripture up, so here's all the scripture for you. But you got your Bibles, right? Inauthenticity uh, causes us to car- car- compartmentalize, <laughs> to break down uh, our, our cells into three, and uh, ourself into three different cells. There's the public self, the private self, and the, the, uh, the secret self. The public self is, that's the self that we, that's the face that we put on when we're in public so that we're not rejected, right? And so that we can control uh, the outcomes of whatever situation it is. So we're only going to show what we want to allow others uh, to see. And part of that may be the real you, right? But there's other parts of that that are, that are, that are hidden. That's not, that's not who you really are. 
But your private self, that's when, that's uh, usually with your family or those that are closest to you, uh, the mask comes off a little bit. And especially when you're stressed, sometimes people in the public self will see this private self when, you're, when, you're, when anxiety hits or you get stressed out or whatever, then they start to see <laughs> some, you know, that mask comes off and, and you start to show up a little bit. Um, and so that's the private self. And then there's the secret self. The secret self. That's, that's what you don't allow anybody to see. Like, you, you might not even try and allow God to see it, but he, he knows. These are the things you hide. This, this is the hurt that you've experienced. This is that secret sin that you don't want anybody to know about. This is uh, where we talked about a few weeks ago. This is shame. That's the secret self. There was a, a, a man uh, in a church I used to pastor at, and every Sunday morning, this is where he would be at, right here, just like this, before church, as people were arriving. He, was, he would pray every Sunday morning. And uh, one of the other ministers in the church, he was like, man, that guy right there, that guy's a real deal. deal. Every Sunday morning, he's here on his knees, and he's praying before the Lord. That man was cheating on his wife multiple times, and he was in the process. It wasn't something that was happening in the past. He was, it was an ongoing thing in his life. You see how we can put on the mask? We can put on the show. Others can be fooled. God isn't fooled. The goal is for us to learn how to be real, to be honest, and to show up as one integrated self, Right? And that doesn't mean that we, we, we show up and say, hey, I'm a cheater, and that's who I am, and that's how I'm always going to be. No, that's not how God created us to be, right? That's not who he's redeemed us to be, right? But it does mean that when we do have shortcomings, and when we do sin, and we do, you know, whatever you want to call it, mistakes, errors, or just plain old sin, that, uh, that we're real about it, right? And we don't act like we're perfect, and we don't act like we have it all together. We're in this together. We're all on a journey. Ananias and Sapphira. Y'all familiar with that story? Uh, Acts chapter 5, I think it is. Uh, it was a married couple, and this was the beginning of the, the new church, and uh, everybody was, uh, a lot of people were selling their land and stuff like that, and they were taking money, and they were giving it to the apostles, and then through the apostles, they would start distributing it to all who had uh, need. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they went and sold all their property, right? And they took a portion of it and they gave it to the apostles and they told them that they gave all of it, uh, but they didn't. And so Peter scolded them. Actually, they got much more than a, <laughs> a scolding, but Peter confronted them and he said, look, he's like, that was your property. You didn't, this is a free will offering. You didn't have to sell your land. And it would have been fine. You wouldn't have been in sin. You know, you could have kept that property for yourself, but you chose to sell, sell it. And that's a good thing, right? But when you sold it, you, at that point, you didn't, there was no requirement for you to give everything. You know, you could give whatever you wanted to. The money was yours, right? It was at your disposal. But you lied. And, and by lying to us, you want to you wanna pretend that you gave it all so you look good in front of everybody else. But you not only lied to us, you lied to God. That's the height of inauthenticity. But we want to be like Christ. We want to claim our identity in, in him. We want to be genuine like Paul, right? That's the goal. And be able to admit that we aren't there yet. When you're inauthentic, or when you're authentic, rather, you'll find that you're less judgmental, that you're more compassionate. You'll find that you're uh, empathetic. Why? Why are, why are we these things when we're, when we're authentic? Because we've been real with ourselves, we've been real with God, we've been real with other people, right? We have nothing to, to hide, and we can confess that, hey, look, I'm, I'm not perfect, right? And I realize when that person screws up that they're not perfect either, right? And I can empathize with their, <laughs> with, with their uh, pain, their struggles, their sorrow. We become more human. We become more kind to others, more respectful. We're less judgmental, right? Because we're not putting on a show. We're not acting like we've got it all together. We become more grace-filled. We become more humble. We're able to take ourselves less seriously. We become better listeners. 
we have fewer uh, emotional uh, threats. We're not as, as reactive because there's no threats. So how can we become more like this? How can we become more authentic? The first thing is to say, uh, seek out a safe community. And there's some overlap between this and the message a couple of weeks ago. To seek out safe community. We need, we all need community. You know, some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts. But we need each other. If you're a human being, you need other, other people in your life. And we don't just need any type of community. We need a, a safe community if we're to become authentic. This is called the Johori uh, window. And what it represents, that top left-hand corner, the blue where it says open, that's our open self. That's like what we're willing, like kind of like our public self. That's, that's what we're willing to share with, with other people. That's what we let other people see. So we know this about ourselves, and other people uh, know it. So that, would be, that could be moments of uh, being authentic, of, of being uh, vulnerable and sharing with other people. But down in the bottom left, the green where it says hidden, that's when we go into hiding. That's when we don't allow people uh, to see certain parts of ourselves. We know it about us, but we're not willing to share it with, with other people. It's important that we find, and that doesn't mean just er anyone, but it's important that we find safe people in our lives that we can share with. These things have to come to light, and not just you in your prayer room, but these things, when we, there's something about when we confess our sins to one another, we are healed. And so we need to find safe people that we're willing to share with, because God works a healing process through that. Then up there in the top right-hand corner, I don't know if that's peach or orange, but uh, that's our blind spots. That's the stuff that we don't know about ourselves, but the reality is, is other people know it. <laughs> they see things about us. See, this is important, too, to find that safe, uh, the safe community. It was about 15 years ago, I sat down with some friends. And I said, hey, I got this uh, game that, that we're going to play. And it's called What's Your Biggest Flaw? It was not in the right spirit. That was not a, 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 a safe community. We were not in the right place at the time to be doing that, and it, and it, and it, and it wasn't good. So it's, what's that? I can't remember. There was, it was three of us. I probably did. <laughs> but it, it is important to find people in your life that, uh, that you can ask this question and say, hey, I'm just willing, I just want to, to uh, people who love you, you know, who care about you and are willing to be honest with you. Because some people, maybe if you're usually defensive all the time, they're scared to share with you. They're, they're scared to be uh, real with you, or they just don't want to hurt you. So it's important to approach people and say, hey, this is a safe place. I just, I just want to, to grow as a believer in, in, in Christ. Would you, you know, would you, uh, is there ways that I show up in life that are un, unhealthy, you know? Or uh, I asked Luke the other day, when I get stressed, like how do I, was that, was that the way I worded it? How do I show up when, when, when I get stressed? And so I said, come on, man, just, just share it with me. It's no, no offense. I know you love me. And I let him share with how I, how I show up and you know, what might be unhealthy ways in, in those times. It's good for us. And that final one, that, that pink one down in the bottom right-hand corner, those are things that we just don't know that we don't know and others don't know about ourselves, but God knows. That's why it's important not just to uh, have community with other people, but have community uh, with God. And so how do we become more authentic? We seek out safe uh, community. Uh, we, make, we make reflective prayer uh, a way of life. You've heard me say it before. Uh, I don't believe just in prayer. I believe in, in prayer where we're willing to sit and listen uh, to God as, as well, that we're not the one giving all the words and just filling our, our prayer with words. Those are important to lay your requests uh, before, before God because he loves to answer uh, our prayers. But uh, we need to invite God into our into our uh, into our thoughts, right? And uh, be more reflective and go, go deep and ask God those questions. Listen for his voice. Uh, it's important that we, practice the, that we practice being courageous, that we step out, you know? Uh, vulnerability and courage are tied together, right? When you, when you step out in courage, it's always a place of vulnerability. So courage can't exist without uh, vulnerability. If vulnerability is not there, then it's not, you're not being brave. 
you're not being courageous, right? It's a place that you're stepping into vulnerability, and that's where courage comes from. So um, being honest and open and, and taking the mask off, it takes an act of, of courage. So we need to practice doing that in, in, our, in our lives. And uh, the last one I would say is to know who you are in Jesus Christ. I call that loving yourself properly, right? Because we know that there's a form of self-love that is idolatry uh, in this world where people are way too consumed with themselves and it's very unhealthy. Uh, actually makes them even more insecure. Um, but uh, then there's those, especially uh, there's a lot of Christians even, that, that self-loathe all the time. They always talk so bad and so low about ourselves. So it's important that we know that we're born into sin but yet God has, uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made by God and we are created in his image, right? And he loves us. <laughs> he loves us so much that he sent his only son, right, for us. And so to redeem us and to, uh, to, uh, to uh, reshape his image in us. So knowing and learning who we are in Jesus Christ and how much we're loved by him and seeing ourselves in a proper light will make us more authentic Christians. So why is, why is practicing authenticity so very important? Because when we're, when we're not hiding, God can work his transformation in us. You know, Whatever is in dark, when we bring it to the light, it becomes light. We receive healing. And so as long as we're hiding, God can't do that work in us. He can't bring healing in our lives. We can't repent as long as we're hiding, right? We can't turn from those ways and be healed. Uh, it inspires other people uh, when we're authentic. They see our humanity. They see that they're not alone, that we're all in this together. Are we all in this together? Y'all agree? Yeah, it's important that we let others know that we're in this together, right? When people are feeling their, their, their failures, right, they don't need somebody uh, judging them. They need somebody who's willing to listen and say, hey, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, but it inspires others to transformation as well. As when they hear uh, your transformation stories and they see what God is doing in your life, it inspires them, right? Uh, it builds confidence to become who God has created us to be, right? When we're, when we're authentic. When everything is laid bare, there's something so uh, uh, freeing about that that we know we can, you know, it's like Paul said, right? I can, I can, pursue, I can pursue what God has called me to be because I know that he's already made, my, uh, made me his own. He's already got me in his hands, so I can, uh, I can run the race of, of, of faith. I can look forward in confidence and forgetting what lies behind. I can pursue Jesus Christ. Uh, when we're authentic, it cultivates intimacy with one another. Don't you feel closer to somebody who's real, right? right? And we think if, we, if we're going to be vulnerable and we're going to share with others, we think we're going to get judgment. But most of the time, it creates more intimacy. Yeah, I don't know how many times, uh, and this was like way before faith walking, I, 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 I noticed this. Like when I would sit down and I would start to open the book, like my life, you know, <laughs> and I would share a weak moment in my life or my current struggles or whatever I'm going through <laughs> organically. And for the longest time, I didn't know why it was happening. But uh, people sometimes would go, you know what? never told anybody this before but and they would begin to share you see what it does it has transforming power when we are when we are real it inspires others to let their their guard down and above all it leads to a life of freedom and joy and purpose there's something about just not only being able to let our walls down but just like letting it down and saying it's okay <laughs> It's all right, you know, I know who I am in Jesus, and it's okay to be where I'm at right now, right? This is where I'm at, and I'm pursuing Jesus. And, and there's something about that that gives us freedom, and it fills us with joy and our purpose in Jesus Christ.